So our speaker today is um, Aiden Seaman, and his talk is going to be about what we what he does at Yabertech and some of the software and computer related challenges that this brings and the aspects of Nixwest that help us address these challenges and why we choose it, how we use it in practice, and our experience of having used it. So similar to a talk we might have had earlier about um, applied Nix at work. So a little bit about Aiden is he is the CTO of Yabertech. So that's interesting to be able to have him here. And he is a software developer, engineer, and physicist by training. Um, he's been using Linux since 1994 and Nix for the past two years. And he is passionate about math, computers, functional programming, and just open source software in general. And talk, I believe this is a pre-record situation, so I will let you um, see that in. Hello, my name is Aiden Seaman, also known as Henson on Freenode. I'm the CTO of Yakertech, and I'm doing a presentation on remote deployments with NixOS and NixOps at Yakertech. At Yakertech, we make a baseball tracking system that tracks pitches and batted baseballs and measures the trajectory of the ball and its spin rate and axis. This gives baseball coaches information on how their pitchers are throwing the ball and the aerodynamic effect of the spin that they put on the ball. For our in-game systems, we use four machine vision cameras running at 200 frames per second to give us a 3D stereo view of the ball at the pitching rubber when it leaves the pitcher's hand, and at home plate when it comes in to the batter and is hit by the bat. These cameras are installed on the side of the baseball field and allow data to be captured during an actual game without being obtrusive and interfering with the gameplay. Our software is written predominantly in Python, with some parts in C++, and some additional parts in Haskell. Our software runs on regular PCs running Linux. We used to use Debian for our old systems, but all of our in-game systems now run NixOS. Let me tell you about some of the challenges we face with our systems. Our in-game systems are usually installed in baseball stadiums, usually in environmentally protected enclosures on the wall of the dugout. These installations are remote, headless, industry-grade PCs without any moving parts. Some of our installations use regular PCs in a more controlled environment. We need to provide connectivity for our customers to connect to the ball tracker with the data display tablet to see the pitch data the system collects, and for the ball tracker to be on the internet for monitoring, data collection, software upgrades, and maintenance. We have to deal with a variety of different network connections based on the facility where it's installed. Some places don't have any network infrastructure at the field, and so we need to use a cellular modem to connect the ball tracker to the internet. These places also don't have any Wi-Fi infrastructure, so we need to provide our own Wi-Fi access point to which the customer connects the data display tablet. Other places do have network infrastructure, in which case we will connect to an Ethernet connection for internet access, and we'll either provide our own Wi-Fi or, more often, connect to their Wi-Fi infrastructure and provide customers with a direct Ethernet connection or Wi-Fi connection through their facility's network. We need to keep a constant watch on our systems to make sure they're operating properly and to detect any failures or problems. We use Zabbix to monitor these systems and provide us with a dashboard that indicates any malfunctions that are detected and provides us with the ability to look at historical data. We keep all of our systems up to date with the latest ball tracker software. In order to do this, we need to ensure the safe installation and upgrading of our software on the ball tracker computers. In addition to being able to safely install and upgrade our software, we also need to install and upgrade the various other programs and libraries on which our software depends. To prevent our operating system from becoming outdated, we need to be able to upgrade it too, as these computers are intended to be in use for many years. We also want to be able to make multiple deployment tracks for our systems, so that we can roll out new changes to certain customers willing to help us test new things before rolling them out to everybody. We also want to have a consistent execution environment for all of our systems. For consistency and ease of debugging and reasoning about problems we encounter, we want the software to behave the same way in the ball field as it does on our development computers. Finally, we need to administer many deployments throughout the United States, monitoring them, collecting data from them, troubleshooting any problems that arise, and keeping their software up to date. Now let me tell you about how NixOS helps us address these challenges. First of all, NixOS makes it easy to configure the system in a consistent way. 
we don't have to edit a lot of individual system configuration files with different syntaxes and file system locations. This eases system management. Everything is specified in the configuration file stored in slash etc slash nixos in the same nix expression language. This single configuration location allows us to unify many heterogeneous components under one configuration umbrella, propagating common variables down into the different components of the system. The Nix expression language also allows us to catch configuration errors at build time using syntax checking, assertions, and variable type constraints. The modularity of the NixOS modules allows us easily to enable or disable chunks of functionality based on the configuration needs of a particular system. We can turn on and configure a certain functionality as simply as writing enable equals true and then filling in the various non-default configuration options in an attribute set. This simple change might then install some new custom software as well as the support libraries and software that goes along with it and configure a cron job to run at a certain time while relying on some global configuration options. Because the Nix language is just text, we can easily keep track of it with Git. This allows us to see when changes were made to systems, as well as experiment with a particular system's configuration and then revert it back with a single Git command. One of the great things about Nix is that it delivers us from dependency hell. No longer do we need to worry about the libraries our software uses being a function of the operating system version we're using. We don't have to upgrade the OS in order to take advantage of a new library nor do we have to upgrade our software in order to move to a newer OS. Like FreeBSD's separation of system software from user software, Nix allows us to separate all software from one another, allowing each one to exist in its own little bubble. One of NixOS's great strengths is the ability to make atomic changes to the installed software, and nearly atomic changes to the running operating system. This frees us from the worry of having a system that is in an inconsistent state due to a failed software upgrade, neither where we started with the old software nor where we wanted to be with the new software, but at some non-functioning intermediate state of limbo requiring time-consuming manual recovery. On top of this is the ability to roll back changes to a previous state, not only for our software but for the entire operating system and its configuration. It's even easy to roll back after doing an operating system upgrade from one NixOS release to another. Try doing that in any other OS. One of the design motivations behind Nix is the creation of reproducible software environments. This allows us to run the exact same software in the ball field as on our development systems. It's just a Nix shell away. To help us manage our many deployments, there is Nix Ops, which allows us to scale all of these benefits up from a single system to a whole bunch of systems. NixOps gives us the ability to build our software locally on our development systems and then upload them to the remote systems. NixOps provides the ability to tune how you deploy your software, including building only, copying only, dry activating to see what changes would be made, testing the changes out without making them permanent, and finally making the changes permanent. This allows us to test new things in a conservative manner to make sure they work properly to avoid bricking systems due to software or configuration problems. We work with G. Christensen and Addis Bladis at Twig.io for a sprint, and they added a feature to NixOps that allowed the automatic rollback of the system configuration in the event that the system becomes unable to communicate due to a configuration change. We researched different mechanisms for deploying consistent and self-contained software to systems, such as Docker, Snap, and AppImage. These suffered from the problems that all of the software had to be bundled in one big chunk, any upgrades to our software environment would have to be a large download that sent over all the dependencies again, even though only one small part may have changed. It was not possible to layer these environments on top of one another. NixOS allows us to have a self-contained software environment while transferring only derivations that have changed, giving us considerably lighter weight updates. NixOS gives us atomic changes not only for our software, but to the whole operating system. The ability to roll back is a very compelling feature allowing a quick recovery from any software or system configuration errors that may arise. Finally, a thing that no other distribution offers is the ability to upgrade the entire OS in a safe and consistent manner, including the ability to roll back in case of any problems. Amazing. Now let me tell you a bit about how we structure our software in NixOS. First, we have NIV that specifies a Nix packages version that our software uses, as well as a version that the operating system uses. These go into the Nix packages sources. 
Our custom software derivations then get overlaid on these Nix packages, which allow them to seamlessly make use of these different package sets from their packages variable. We also have our own custom NixOS modules. These Nix packages and our NixOS modules then get imported into the NixOS system configuration on a particular machine and are combined with the desired NixOS configuration options. This NixOS system is then put into a NixOps deployment, which then gets built locally and uploaded and installed into the remote system. Now I'll tell you a bit about how the different software profile tracks work. First, at the top we have our NixOps deployments, which are in a Git repository. Let's say we have deployments 1 through M. Deployments 1 and 2 use the release profile. Deployments 3 and 4 use the testing profile. Deployment M is using the experimental profile. The release and testing profiles check out different versions of our custom Nix packages Git repository. This allows them to see different package sets in NixOS modules. In a particular version of the Nix packages repository, the various software derivations will check out a particular version of its respective custom software, which is stored in a different Git repository. These are the Git repos 1 through N. This allows the testing profile to use completely different, or perhaps slightly different, software in NixOS modules compared to the release profile, all while existing in the same NixOps deployment. When we want to move a system from release to testing, it's as simple as changing a single line of text. To move the testing profile from one set of software to the next, it's as simple as changing a git hash string. The experimental branch points to a live directory for the custom Nix packages, which in turn point to the live directories of our software. This allows us to make changes on our development systems and test them on experimental systems without having to commit them to the repositories. Once we're satisfied that the experimental version works properly, then we commit the changes to the various repositories and then bump the git hashes to move the experimental versions down to testing and usually testing down into release. Since our systems are deployed remotely, we want any changes we make to be safe and not to result in the system becoming inaccessible. For any big system configuration changes, we usually set a reboot timer and then run a NixOps deploy in test mode. Not only will NixOps cause the system to revert after a few minutes if it becomes inaccessible, but the timed reboot will cause the system to reboot back into the previously good state as the test deployment does not make any permanent changes. The atomic-like system configuration changes allow us to make large changes to the system networking and to be confident that NixOS will make the necessary changes happen in a consistent way that will ultimately result in a system that can still be reached. I'll now describe some of our findings after having used NixOS for several months. First of all, I found the learning curve to be quite brutal. As Nix and NixOS are quite different than the way most Linux distributions work, it was a challenge even to figure out how to install a specific version of software, or to figure out what package provided a certain thing I wanted. In hindsight, if I had read through the NixOS, Nix packages, and Nix package contributors manuals, I would have been able to understand it more rapidly. A lot of things are not documented very well, and in many cases you just have to read the derivation or module source code to figure out how it works. It also didn't help that one of the first things I tried doing was taking some closed binary libraries and using patchelf to convert them into NixOS packages. That is definitely not mentioned in any manuals. I find that NixOS systems are much easier to maintain than the old Debian systems. Knowing that when the time comes to upgrade the OS, I won't be faced with a failed distribution upgrade is a big relief. It's also one of the reasons why I moved my laptop and cloud servers away from Debian and Ubuntu to NixOS. NixOS causes more upfront pain in trying to figure out how to configure things the NixOS way, but once you've got it, you'll never have to manually repair a half-upgraded Ubuntu system by installing 100 packages with dpackage multiplied by the number of deployments you have. We never have to worry about libraries becoming unsupported due to the connection between the libraries we're using and the OS we're running. We can keep our software running on the same set of stable libraries without needing to hold back upgrades to our operating system. Due to NixOS's atomic configuration changes, test deployments, and rollbacks, I've never had a system become inaccessible. I've been able to convert a couple old Debian ball tracker systems to NixOS using a kexec takeover. Thank you to Clever for sharing his kexec nix derivations with me. 
Some pain points we experience with NixOS and NixOps is that once a system is under NixOps control, we can't really locally tweak it from its slash etc slash NixOS directory anymore. In practice, this hasn't really been a problem, but it's too bad the two aren't compatible with each other. The current pain point is that we need to structure our derivation such that any configuration options coming into it doesn't trigger a rebuild. Some of our software is time-consuming to rebuild and rebuilding a new version each time we change a configuration string is a real pain. Careful structuring of our software and using wrappers to pass configuration options in by environment variables or command line options can alleviate this problem. Here are the credits for the baseball field picture I got from Wikipedia and the ThinkPad picture I got from Flickr. Finally, a big thank you to everyone on the NixOS channel on Freenode. I would have given up a long time ago if it wasn't for your helpful answers to my many questions. And thank you to the NixOS community for all your hard work in building this great operating system and software ecosystem. Hello, we have Aiden here for the Q&A portion of the talk, and I'll be jumping in reading off the questions right away to you. Okay. So the first question we have is, is the name Yakartek derived from the Japanese word for baseball, Yaku? I'm not sure if it's derived from the Japanese name, but there is a type of ball, uh, a pitch called a, a Yaku ball in <clears throat> American baseball. It's not very well known, and a few, a few baseball people who we talk to know about it, but uh, it comes from the name Yaku ball. Interesting, right. So the next question we have is, what system architecture do your industrial PCs use? They're just regular um, PCs. Um, they uh, uh, regular Intel PCs. <clears throat> They're like I think um, i7s, usually like uh, eight core i7s. Um, they're by a brand called uh, Nusys. They're the Nuvo the Nuvo 7000 series, and so they're they're just um, they don't have any moving parts. They have a humongous heat sink, so they don't need fans, and they're uh, good to operate at uh, high temperatures. And they're just extra tough computers. Yeah, those sound pretty cool. OK, so the other one is, you mentioned a live directory mechanism. How yeah. the changes are picked up by this live directory? Is it an NFS directory? If I do a commit on experimental branch, how does it get picked up? I feel like it's rolled many questions there. I hope you can handle that. OK, that's fine. <clears throat> on the, on the non-experimental branch, the, the directory that it looks in for the like default.nix file, for example, um, on the, on the non-experimental, those come out of a Git repository. And so then it looks um, in that Git repository for the default.nix. But on the uh, experimental version, it just looks in an actual directory on my computer for the default.nix. So I can change things in that directory without, um, it, it, um, without it having to be committed. And those changes are uh, picked up by, by Nix. And I can just rebuild them. And then that live directory is actually the repository um, that the changes get pushed into, which the non-experimental versions actually check out. And so whenever I'm satisfied with a um, experimental um, change, then I just uh, commit that and push that out to the um, sort of remote where it's stored. And then the other branches are able to pick up on that uh, commit that I've just made. Right. Um, I believe you answered all those questions perfectly. <laughs> OK. So rolling your own Nix packages repo slash not using official channels, how much real building do you have to do versus leveraging the official cache? Well, for, uh, only some of our packages are uh, custom packages. And so we do have to rebuild all of our custom packages, obviously. But um, for the most part, um, we're able to, to make heavy use of the existing caches. And for the ones that, um, for, for the things that aren't in the official cache, NixOps just uploads them to, um, to, the, uh, to the target computer. There are some, some custom ones, and then we, we um, ones that get, get, get reused. And so we just um, bundle those up into like a, a BZIP NAR file and store them in, in, in one of our cloud computers, and then just push those out to the, to the systems that uh, need it. So it's kind of heavy use of the official caches, um, medium use of like a, an unofficial just um, SSH or secure copy with a, with a Nix store import, and then uh, NixOps pushes all, all the rest of the stuff in. 
Right, right. So um, hmm, the next one is, how, um, is this slide related to it? it? says, do you have references to the NixOS bootstrapping via KXEC part? Yeah, um, I can I can post the um, the um, uh, link to uh, Clever's GitHub uh, repository where I got those things from. Okay. Do you do secure boot and enforce root FS integrity like with DM DM verify? I think that's the word right there. Let me misspell on your industrial PCs. No, no, we we don't do secure boot. Yeah, I think um, there's also a connected thought, but I will not mention that. So could you explain a bit more how you k-exec from Debian to NixOS? Yeah, yeah, so. So I experimented with this um, first before using Clever's um, um, derivations, but uh, Clever's derivations are very nice in that it sort of bundles it all together in a simple like Nix build sort of script. Clever so, is so clever. <laughs> and so so what you do, Linux is able to, um, there is the kexec tools package, which allows you to have like a, uh, a, a bz image and an initrd image. And then Linux, while it's running, is able to take these, load these into memory, and then essentially like instantly stop its operation and boot into this new kernel and load up the new initrd. And so all you have to do to take over a computer, which I've done with a couple actual computers and several um, cloud hosted computers. For example, the cloud hosted computers often don't have, 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 have NixOS as an option. And so you just install Debian and then upload your KXX stuff and then um, do this thing to take them over. And you have to be connected to like your sort of KVM terminal on your cloud computer. And um, then, then you're able to sort of continue typing and do the NixOS installation. But, but once you uh, uh, load this kexec in, uh, thing into memory and then run it, it will, um, you might be able to see my cat here. Um, it, will, it, will then, um, it will then instantly reboot and you're essentially just dropped into a NixOS installation um, where you can then do the, do the install. Um, and you can reformat the, uh, the, uh, the uh, hard drive and, and all that kind of stuff. The only caveat is that if, if you if your computer turns off for some reason partway through the install, then your computer's host. Okay, right. If you want to um, adjust your cat, oh, it looks like they walked away. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. They got the cue. Okay, <laughs> next question. So there's a question here about um, auto patch elf hook, which is a um, hook infrastructure that's inside of Nix packages, and they say it should be less painful than using patch off manually. So have you considered actually using that? I have. I, I, I have not done that. When I, when I first started um, doing this, I've, I've only had to do it once. It was when I was beginning learning uh, Nix, and so I didn't encounter the uh, auto patch elf. Doing the, the patch elf manually, I had to make some other little scripts which would check to make sure that all the, all the libraries that the thing depended on had been converted over to the um, appropriate NixOS libraries. Um, and so it was a, a real manual sort of um, procedure but once I did it the uh, the uh, two times that were required I didn't have to do it anymore right so it's like <laughs> don't refactoring when it's going to be more work to refactor in the first place but exactly. actually I think yeah. using auto patch elf hook is actually pretty simple too I think you just add it and have the dependencies and build inputs okay okay I have another question which um, is being live formatted so um, <laughs> Excuse me if I um, just take one second to sort of read over it to make sure it's not completely difficult to um, pronounce. Okay, I see it here. Okay, so it uh, says, is it possible to locally configure systems developed with NixOps? You can just copy the configuration to the remote machine in an activation script. And then there is a, um, it appears to be a blog post referencing Auto upgrade with NixOps and NixOps. Okay, I will. I will copy that and we'll investigate that. Because that that could be very helpful. Yep, noted. So I don't think we have um, any more questions. I can check the channel to see if there's any noise in there left. Um, there's one more. It says, "How many people are there with you that manage all these servers?" So <laughs> just a staffing question, I guess. 
just just one, just me. Just one. Okay, just you. Okay, I think that um. <laughs> okay, I have a missed question. Sorry. So, can this hardware be core booted, or was that asked asked already? I'm not sure. What does what does core booted mean? Um, I'm trying to actually remember which core boot is. I think that might have to do something with like a like like a firmware platform. If you don't know what core boot is, then I guess you won't have to answer this question. It would okay, definitely yeah. be a no then. Yeah, I uh, don't think so. Okay, I guess that um, concludes your Q&A portion. Thank you so much. You had a very lively um, Q&A session here. It was literally coming in as I was trying to give it to you in some points. Okay, well, it was my pleasure.